Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program was brought to you by Brooklyn Slate, a manufacturer of slate cheese boards, coasters, and other fine items. For more information, visit brooklynslate.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Hello, this is uh, Dorothy Can Hamilton, and today you're listening to Chef Story. We're broadcasting from beautiful Roberta's in cold Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn's not cold. I know. Okay, here's my <laughs> Brooklyn buddy. I am so excited today. Uh, the chef, uh, we've known each other a long time, and we're both from Brooklyn, so you're going to all have to, this is the Brooklyn Day on Chef Story, but uh, Michael Amonico, my guest today, is probably one of the most respected chefs in New York City, um, if not the whole country. Uh, Michael has a stellar past, which we're going to get into, but he's worked at such extraordinary restaurants as Le Cirque, um, 21 Club, and uh, and I think many people know he was the uh, executive chef at Windows on the World on 9-11. Uh, but we're going to get into Michael's story. He has books, he's had TV shows, he's actually a trained actor, but the most important thing is he's one of the greatest Brooklyn guys I know. So welcome, Michael. <laughs> we love Brooklyn. We love Brooklyn. It's here so, we are. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. You know, it is really a trip to come out to Bushwick. Uh, you know, this is very exciting for me because I- I'm so happy to see this rebirth of Brooklyn. Brooklyn is such a thriving part of New York. Right. You and I remember this as the UPS lot and, <laughs> and the school bus lots. I mean, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, for those of you who don't aren't here, which is the epicenter of the new restaurants in the world, you know, the it's, Blancas and Roberta's yeah, here, yeah. And, and lots of uh, exciting young restaurants. You go to Paris and they're talking about Le Brooklyn. Le, Le Brooklyn. Le Williamsburg. No kidding. Yeah, it's but so, but it's exciting. You know, I really, I think that this constant uh, revitalization is a, a, for anything is is vital. Yeah. So, so Michael, tell us about the Brooklyn you were born into, and where and what it was like when you were born, and was it. It wasn't this, was it? No, Le no. Brooklyn. It wasn't no, the Brooklyn back no, then. No, but you know what? Brooklyn has always been. Um, it has been for 200 years an exciting place for people to live. I mean, it it was a vital part of New York City's growth and development. And, of course, we all know that Brooklyn was a city until it was incorporated into the greater New York City. It was its own separate city, right? So, And it was probably a bad thing. And Brooklynites are proud. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Brooklynites yeah. are proud of being the fourth largest city in America. In America. And they've always have had that. I mean, that is, uh, I think, historically, that's the truth to that. I grew up in uh, Italian American Bensonhurst, and um, you know, in in the, uh, it, 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 I mean, that was a vital working class neighborhood, still is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I heard stories of uh, you know, uh, uh, Dodgers, uh, the do- the players living in Brooklyn mm-hmm. and uh, being people's neighbors, and you know, I uh, so, but the Dodgers had were 
uh, when I was really three years old, they moved out of Brooklyn. So I heard Dodgers stories about how it was terrible. I I, one time I was cooking for the O'Malley's and I got a chance to tell them how they broke my father's heart. <laughs> uh, and after that, we became Yankees fans. Although that's a, that with an old Dodgers fan, you'd never have that. Really, a lot of the Dodger fans became Mets fans. That's uh, right. They, they would, would never, never go become for the Yankee Yankees fans. fans but right. the, that's, a, that's another long story. Right. Look, Brooklyn, I, I, I love Brooklyn and lived here for the better part of my life. And... Um, it, I, has I, it, it has soul. It Manhattan has soul. Manhattan has commerce. I have to we say, have soul out here. <laughs> I mean, I have to be. I have to be upfront. I'm a Manhattanite now because it's just closer to work, mm-hmm. and it's less. Uh, it's less stress. On I, I spend more time in the kitchen and at work, mm-hmm. so it's important for me to kind of be close. But I make regular field trips, not only to Bushwick to come out to uh, Williamsburg to hit the these restaurants uh, and galleries and what a great vital neighborhood this is, but also to go out to, you know, Coney Island and uh, I, I go out to exactly Randazzo's or, or to go out to, uh, you know, to Tono's Pizzeria. Yeah. I'm hoping, you know, I, I got my know. fingers crossed for, for those guys. And Hurricane uh, Sandy yeah, did a number right, on them. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I still have a lot of roots in, in Brooklyn. Well, let's, let's talk about that because you know what? Manhattan might have the restaurants, but Brooklyn really had the food. I mean, we uh, thought we did. <laughs> We, we, we've we, always thought we'd You do. know, we didn't have so many restaurants. People really cooked at home. But you think of the bakeries, you know, not only the bagels that you could get, but the salt sticks and the Kaiser rolls. Do you remember? Well, I'm glad. You know, listen, I'll be brief. But I grew Don't be up. Brief. I grew up with that. You see, I no, I grew up with not supermarkets, but everything was from artisanal supply, Absolutely. right? Okay. Right. Are you ready? We. <laughs> We made our own dried sausage every winter. We, you know, that was an October thing. We made our own wine. That was really something my family did for decades, right? And they were phasing it out as I was growing up Where in the sixties. Where did they 60s. get the grapes back then? Grapes were from California. Grapes were from California. Made wine, uh, and we made dried sausage. You call it cacciatorini. What, that ta- kind of- what age were you drinking wine from the the family? Uh, Are you allowed cast? to say? Are you yes, allowed to say? yes, yes. Now it would be we're abuse, trying- right? Wait, this is called chef story. We're getting into your story. Well, you we know, want the they, real story. They always Michael. get. They go if when you hit seven years old, you got a taste of wine in your soda. On a Sunday, a taste, you know, because yeah. wine was on the table. It was a food. It wasn't. Right. It wasn't uh, really something that was viewed as more than that. It was really. Right. And if you go to Italy today, I have cousins in Sicily, and I've mm. been with them, and mm. and and been to Sicily. When they drink wine, they don't over drink. Really, they they're very. They don't drink much. It's right. it's part of a meal is a mm-hmm. glass of wine, mm-hmm. not much more than that. Right. So that's how I grew up. It was just part of a meal, and you right. got to taste it. Right. But you didn't really, you know, get a glass so of. So what was what was your favorite dish? On a Sunday, so Sunday. Did you call it sauce or gravy? No, it's gravy. It's gravy. It's gravy. This is Brooklyn. You it's call gravy. It gravy. It's gravy. All right, it's tell gravy. us about the. Well, Sundays. it's gravy because it's because it's sugo. You know, because it has all of these other things. It's not just tomato sauce. It's tomato. It's gravy because it has it has pork and beef and you know there was beef brujol. What, what or, is sugo? Well, sugo in the in, in Italy you'll find a sugo will be a. Uh, a gravy, really, that goes over a pasta oh. might be a pork sugo or a lamb ah. or, you know, and okay. so S-U-G-O, sugo. Okay. And so that was really the gravy. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what we grew up with. But we made sausage, but we also bought eggs that only came from farms in New Jersey that were candled. We only, right? What do you mean candled? Candled. We, we bought eggs never in a supermarket. We bought our eggs from someone who brought them from New Jersey to a little storefront, and each one he held up in front of a candle to see if it was a good egg or a bad egg. And we, tell us about a good egg and a bad egg. Well, a bad egg uh, had a chicken in it? Yeah, exactly. Okay. exactly. <laughs> or it had blood, and you know. So we bought eggs from the egg man. We bought fish from the fish man that, you know, that was what fresh. What kind of fish? fish. From uh, Sheepshead Bay? Would the fish man come from, or well, Montauk, you know, or where? you know, from the Fulton Market, uh, in the 60s, there were probably still some boats that were bringing local fish uh, that were close enough to, to come into, uh, uh, you know, I, I it wasn't all fish that was trucked from other places. There was local, there is local fish today. You can, mm-hmm. you can go to Sheepshead Bay and find some local fish. You can go out to Montauk and get lots of local fish. We know that. But, right. but, uh, but the fish man, the fish butcher, the fishmonger was like the 
There was the butcher. You went to the butcher for meat, and it was all sides of beef or, you know, animal carcasses that were broken down. So I grew up seeing that. You know, that was something that was really part of, you know, my food. My mother taught me more about food than anything I've ever learned since was from ingredients. You know, I remember so clearly the first thing I learned to do was cook cranberry beans, you know, cleaning them cleaning the beans out of the shells and then cooking them with my mother that was and she taught me how to make zeppoli and she taught me how to make how to clean calamari i mean i was a uh, i was the youngest of of uh, the three brothers i was the youngest my other two brothers were really older much older they were off to high school already when i was born so my mother you know i was yeah. i did i was in the kitchen with her she showed me all of these things that i remember to this day so um those italian american dishes those but also Did they Sicilian. have vegetable trucks coming down? Vegetable your trucks down the street. So you didn't even oh, have yeah. to go because I, especially in season, because that was all Long Island, right? And you know that was Long Island and New Jersey vegetables. You know you, it and was, they would bring them in a yeah. truck on the back of a truck on the back. Forget the green market; they came to your street, right? <laughs> and it was a, there were trucks full of local vegetables. Yeah, and in the fall there was fruit that were on those trucks too. All the local apples, and you know, so I really have this. This is how food is in my head. You know, from the butcher, the fishmonger, you know, the egg man, uh, all, all of these things, and it was all. Uh, and they didn't the, have it in Manhattan, did they? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this was this was this was a village, right? I mean, right. it was Bensonhurst, but it was like you were shopping in a village, and everything was specialized. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd go to one butcher because he was better at beef, and another butcher. Because because he was, you go to the pork store the for pork. pork. Just pork. Yeah. The butcher was just pork. Chicken, chicken markets. We only bought live chicken, right? We, live chicken. I mean, it sounds like, like it, it, we're talk, it sounds like we're talking about like <laughs> another century. Well, it is another century, right? But this is mid-century Brooklyn. Right. You know, we bought, and you know what? There were live poultry markets. There are more live poultry markets today in New York City. In New York City today than there were 30 years ago. Really? Because they had really died out. You know, they'd really passed the uh-huh. live poultry markets. But in, in the 60s, when I was, a, uh, when I was a, 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 a kid in school, poultry markets were kind of everywhere in the Italian-American okay, okay, neighborhoods. Okay, chef. Now I need some chef education here. Why is live poultry better than maybe getting um, a D'Artagnan? Or I'm not saying it's better than no, a but, but but you have some that are beautifully raised and and slaughtered and and brought in. Is it better I, well, to air look, chill them and age them, or is it better to have a super fresh, pluck them yourself chicken? Well, there's a couple of I think there's a couple of real reasons and. Uh, one is really just the quality of of the bird itself in the poultry markets are a better quality bird um, and you can buy one that's more sustainably uh, grown today uh-huh. in in that day in the 60s you know they were sustainably grown chickens because they were from Jersey they weren't even from Maryland you know right. <laughs> they were really from upstate New York they were a very local chicken mm-hmm. and the live market meant that they were as super fresh as you want poultry to be you want poultry to be as fresh as possible right so um, you know it's a, it's the it's the unfortunate cycle of life of a chicken mm. but you know they were <laughs> they were great chickens that were locally grown mm. and you know that that passed away that that became you know really Processed chickens became the thing that you saw in supermarkets. So, do you think the product? But they taste different. So, what what inspired you to be a chef? Was it the produce, or was it working with your mother? Because did you go to a lot of restaurants when you were a kid? So we went to no restaurants. Exactly. exactly. We, well, I, I, well, what restaurant? It, I, I have to say, Chinese food. <laughs> No, really, that was exotic. <laughs> Bensonhurst is like the biggest. It's it's like another state of Italy. And but so- we grew up. You know, we were we were we were uh, Italian Americans, and we were we were uh, Jewish Americans side by side. That's really right. what the that was. You know, the diversity was that was the diversity then. It's a di- it's different right. today, which right. is, makes you know. Brooklyn is, but I lived. Immig- in, but I lived in Brooklyn immigrants. in the '70s when the Caribbeans were moving in, and yeah. uh, would drive out to you know be, go out to Church chicken. Avenue, right, to go find jerk chicken. I was you know go looking for those things right. when I was you know. So in Bensonhurst, in, they had a good Chinese restaurant, but there were you know those those Chinese American restaurants were like you know probably what you would expect right. pre Nixon, right? Because pre pre Nixon's trip to China, it was Chinese like yeah. all over America. But right. but on the other hand, you know. 
I also knew a little bit about Chinatown because my grandmother lived in Little Italy, oh. and we had a lot of roots in Little Italy, so we got to... Um, Walk across the canal yeah, street. We were there a lot <laughs> when I was young. Uh-huh. You know, the Chinese markets were next to the Italian markets, one street different, that kind of thing. So, But um, Italian Americans in those days, there wasn't a lot of money for restaurants. Restaurants were a special thing, but... So the Chinese food, so did you have a special... It was special and exotic, yes, that was... But also, you know, know, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so she really did all the cooking. We, you know, we didn't get out. That much. I mean, so what? What? Where was but, the tipping point for you to be a chef? On what cuisine? You so Chinese I, cuisine. I think. I. You know, it's interesting. I'll tell you because I think here's the, here's the, the snapshot. Go ahead. So there I go. I I go to college and I'm a theater major and I eventually get out into the world, uh, you know, and I start to explore this city, New York City, and start to really develop an interest in food. In the 70s, I think there was a whole new generation of people who were, you know, uh, the, that generation was exploring food in a new way. And um, and uh, I think New York always offered so much diversity in its culinary history that, you know, as a, just as a, as a, you know, young guy, I, I was exploring. And I was, uh, I traveled as an actor uh, through the better part of this country, and I spent a, a lot of time in a year and a half of traveling. So I saw a lot of American cooking, real American cooking. Wow! And uh, and I mean to say, New Orleans in 1976, and uh, in the, the southern states in 1975, and and that mid that mid part of the 70s, we were coming on the bicentennial. Mm-hmm. So America Americana was a big deal. And and James Beard's writing in relation to that was a big deal. And so I began to read and explore and eat. And before you know it, I quit acting, went back to school, New York City College of Technology to enter the restaurant hospitality management program. So it was American food that drove me into it. But my hobby as a chef was cooking Chinese food because of going to the markets in Chinatown, buying ingredients, and from a couple of really good books, you know, trying at home to make noodles, to make dumplings, to make uh, Peking duck. And so it was a very um, cathartic thing for me to cook. And when I came to this tipping point where I thought, gee, I love cooking so much, I'm going to explore this. Going back to school was an important part of that process for me because I, I, really, needed to, um, I really needed to retool and, okay, and so I, we're gonna we're gonna take a little break here, and when we come back, we're gonna explore what you did going to school and after. Today, I'm talking to Michael Lamonaco, the executive chef of Porterhouse in New York City, at the Time Warner Building. We'll be right back. Brooklyn Slate Company is a collaborative effort from Brooklyn graphic designer Sean Tice and Parsons graduate student Christy Hedeka. After visiting Christy's family slate quarry in upstate New York in the spring of 2009, the two grabbed a few pieces for use as all-purpose boards back home in Brooklyn. They found a number of purposes for the slate and began gifting pieces to friends. The response was so overwhelmingly positive that the two struck out to produce a line of slate products. They now make regular trips to the family quarry in upstate New York to hand-pick their favorite pieces of black and red slate. Some of the slate is sourced from the quarry graveyard, a collection of odd-shaped pieces that were ultimately destined to be ground for use as road cover or baseball diamonds. They then transport the pieces to their studio in Red Hook, Brooklyn, where they do additional cutting and clean the stone to be food slate. Every single piece of packaging that comes with their products, from the envelope to the burlap bag, can be repurposed for other uses. The end result is a product completely unique in cut, shape, color, and overall presentation. For more information and to order, visit brooklynslate.com. Well, welcome back. You're listening to Chef Story, and I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton. And today my guest is executive chef Michael Lamonaco from 
the restaurant Porta House in the Time Warner building. And later on in the program, we'll hear more about that. But Michael, we were just we we're just talking about how you jumped from your Italian roots to loving Chinese food, and then being an actor and traveling around and discovering American. And you just started New York City Technical College. Tell us. Tell us what that was like. What year you were back there in the 80, early uh, 80s? 83. 83. 83. So, so what what drove you? What kind when you at that stage what kind of chef did you want to be? And what did you where did you think you'd end up? Well, you know, there there were not a lot of choices for um, for schools uh, and for training. And on the job training is great, but it's not the full it's not the full immersion that um, that you can get in a in a in an academic setting, uh, or, or or it can be not the full immersion. It really depends on the individual place. So so I really I you know I really had a time frame. I wanted to get going with this change. And um, City University has had this program that uh, at at in the City Technical College in Brooklyn in Brooklyn, right? Yes. Uh, that's after a post World War II. Really, for the Korean vets returning, they really the program really ramped up. Oh, really? Is yeah, how the, it got the Kore- Yeah, so and like the Culinary Institute of America, that also started with the right after World War Two. Right, right, exactly. So this retraining, this idea of trade schools and training mm-hmm. people in a in a setting like that, it was a good one for me, and mm-hmm. it was also it was also at that time a very uh, French classical system oriented. Mm-hmm. And you're going to like this because I love. From I love French cooking, French culture. Mm-hmm. Since my grade school days of junior high school French, I <laughs> took junior high school French. I took high school French. I took college really? French. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. So I, I had this, you know, I had this real passion for the. Had you, you know, had any French food? No, nope, not really. Very, very limited. Duckle orange, <laughs> you know, very limited. But then you know what? I I did have exposure to it. As I, uh, you know, in my twenties, then going out to some of the great French bistros mm-hmm. that pop that have uh, thrived in Manhattan mm-hmm. near the West Side, and there were some great bistros that were really immigrant-run bistros mm-hmm. that had authentic bistro cooking. And as a twenty-year-old, that that was some place that I was going. So I mm-hmm. had this in my, and you know, I loved French food, and this is what they taught. But it was really about the system, and I thought that the, I identified with systematic way of learning something mm-hmm. um, the way I had had learned acting there mm-hmm. was something systematic the method the method not, not only that the method yeah. but also you know what they do in college I, I went to um, a Brooklyn college uh, where I, I graduated from Brooklyn College with a, a degree in speech and theater. And that was a very, you know, that was, it was something very methodical about how you are taught acting uh, and you're taught drama, you know, from, from the experimental uh, Grotusky to uh, Shakespeare, you know, and everything in between. In that setting, I know I can learn, you know. And that's great analogy. And I thought I can identify with this system. Mm-hmm. And that's what I got at City Tech. I got a real system of learning and mm-hmm. I really feel it what it did was it gave me a really well rounded skill set mm-hmm. that what I would do with it I didn't know. So so when you came out, did you say, I want to own my own restaurant? I want to go work in one of the temples of all, astronomy? You know, all through school, I worked at Monty's Venetian Room on the Gowanus Canal. <laughs> I worked... I uh, love the shrimp scampi there. <laughs> I worked at Monty's. It's still there. Monty's is still there. Oh, is there. it still open? Well, yeah, there's some... You know, there. it's... Not, Nick Monty is gone now, but mm-hmm. Nick Monty was my mentor and hired me as, you know, a prep cook. Mm-hmm. Then I worked in the Garde Manger. Then I worked on the broiler station. Then I worked on saute. And I was going to school in the day and working at night. And I learned how to cook Italian American, you know, that classic. All right, we're red all sauce. going to the Bor- Porter House. <laughs> Porter <laughs> House, soon, New York. And I'm gonna, you're going to make me shrimp scampi. Well, I can do it. I can <laughs> I do know, it. I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order it. Escalon. <laughs> Escalon. I can 
couldn't do it. Uh, and I love to cook Italian. It's what I do at home is cook Italian food and not just the oh. Italian American favorites, but also the Sicilian things that my my mother made. And you know, yeah. it's really part of me is right. Italian. So tell me about your career path because I know we have a lot of people out there that love to follow how right. a great chef becomes a great chef. But I, you know, so it was all about skill development for a year and a half. Both after, both days and nights, it was all about how do I develop my skills. So while you're in school, you're working at Monty's. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Upon graduation, I worked uh, at a private club, which was a kind of a fancy midtown uh, luncheon and dinner club, private private uh, oh you mean like the, uh, like the university club right exactly like I worked at a private club you know I got a call and Alan Sayak was mm-hmm. the chef at Le Cirque and that was the turning point and I did want to work at Le Cirque I really wanted to work mm-hmm. in what was in its day the epitome of dining in New York and certainly one of the great um, world destinations mm-hmm. for dining was Le Cirque in mm-hmm. the in the mid 80s and uh, Alan hired me you know uh, as a starting cook and um, you know I worked with Alan and I worked with Danielle Ballou because Alan left a, a, you know, a year later, and then I worked with Danielle for about nine months. And um, I followed Alan to the 21 Club, and mm-hmm. I was a daytime saucier slash sous chef. Mm-hmm. So four years after graduating in 1989, um, I had come and gone from the 21 Club. Uh, but uh, four years after graduating from school, I was rehired back at 21 as the executive chef. Four and, and a half years later. So, yeah. So, wow. in 1989, I became, you know, that was... I know. You had such good acting ability. You were acting like <laughs> Paul Bocuse or I something. <laughs> I, you know what? You could... And, and I, I have to say, it's only a short time ago. That was 24 years ago. It really doesn't seem like... 24 years I know. It doesn't ago. seem that long to me. But I'll tell yeah. you, at that time, you know, chefs were always in the kitchen. Chefs only worked in one place. Uh-huh. Chefs really didn't own restaurants. It's mm-hmm. really been an unbelievable ride to see how the American culinary scene uh, and and the American chefs, how they've kind of transformed the industry, uh-huh. not only for Americans, but I think worldwide, have really had an effect. Absolutely. That's I, the I, Le Brooklyn effect, really, on, on the world. <laughs> that's it, really. So, um, so take us, so you were at Le Cirque. What, 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 did, what did the working in a place like that give you? You worked there for how long? Three years? Uh, I worked there for a year and a half. I'll tell you, I saw everything there. Now, we worked six days a week, and you either worked lunch or dinner. I worked both uh, at different times. I'd worked both both shifts. Uh, Everything was, you know, made in-house, right? So we butchered animals. Uh, We had a butcher there who uh, we had uh, uh, baby lamb. uh, The, you know, suckling pig came in. Uh, We did all the, we learned the fish butchery. Uh, and you had to set your station up or whatever. If I worked on the grill station or I worked on the fish station or the veg station, you did everything from scratch. So, again, it came down and to... And you did volume. And you too. did volume. Le, Le Cirque was a very, very busy restaurant. Mm. And uh, it was a hot restaurant, you know. Mm. It was different dining than it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a different dining scene, but it was as relevant then as anything would be today. Mm-hmm. And it was a great... It was a great place to learn. Actually, it was more relevant. There were only one or two restaurants that really had the whole world, the paparazzi or the, the celebrities right. of the world pass through, and that was one of them. You're right. And today, there's probably 10 restaurants that they go to or 20. You're right. It is mm-hmm. very, very – food has become entertainment. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that was clear that people would – you know, not buy a ticket to a show today. They don't buy a ticket to a show. They go to a, you know they go, they go to, to a bar dinner. or a restaurant, and, right. and that's the show. So, so you were at Le Cirque, and then Danielle came, and then you went to Twenty One. And Danielle changed and, the whole menu. We did a whole new menu with Danielle. So that was again, it was all about skill set and how mm-hmm. much can you do. And and to this day, I'm very close to Alan Sayak and very close to Danielle, mm-hmm. and they were they were really my true mentors and the French. Uh, you know that they're as American as I am. You mm-hmm. know, at Danielle and Alan, mm-hmm. but their training. You know, that's what a mentor is. A mentor takes what they've learned and pass it on. Mm-hmm. And Danielle and Alan both passed on skills to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Danielle, uh, Alan, for his great organization and his uh, his precise. Uh, manner of work and his the way he ran a kitchen and Danielle also had a, a similar uh, s- set of skills in, in organization and management but also Danielle had come from a different part of France so he brought from Lyon this real 
farm to table idea mm-hmm. and that was you know 1987 so, t- tell me something because we have a lot of young uh, cooks and chefs out there listening to the program how important is it to go to a really great kitchen how long should you stay there what is it that you should take from the sh- you're saying from the mentorship I think the most uh, I think the most valuable time you have is those those years where you're learning, and you, I think that skill acquisition, uh, the toolkit, is the probably one of the most important things you could do for yourself for later development, and that at some point you'll have an opportunity to uh, be creative in your own personal way. But in early part of the career, I think it's not about my. I think it's not about the cook's creativity. And I was a cook. It wasn't about my creativity. It was about my ability to uh, perform the creation of the chef uh, you, you know in other words each restaurant has its own symphony and you're you're not only in the orchestra you're playing it and part of the creative process is the is that that recreation every night of what that chef's menu is and if that becomes consistency that's part of the skill development and you get to a point where in order to be free as a creative person you have to really know your instrument uh, the old French used to call the stove, they used to call it the piano. That's what they called it. And so I came from that school with, you know, you learn to play the piano. So no How gr- long does that take? I, you know, I, I think it depends on the individual. But is it two years, three? I can't say how long it takes someone. But you want to be in a kitchen where you're exposed to as many influences as possible. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, to, in order to build that toolkit. Mm-hmm. And it's for some people and not for others, and it's really a personal we were, journey. Yeah, we, we were personally talking before the show about your kitchen. You're a, you're a tremendous restaurant, fabulous kitchen. It's a large kitchen, and, and you're doing a lot of stuff there. And maybe some of the students or she- young chefs want to work in smaller kitchens. But right. there's something to be said about uh, obtaining the toolkit in a kitchen like yours. And... <sighs> You know, could you elaborate? Well, a I'll, on I'll that? tell you. You know, when I uh, when I put my proposal together for Porterhouse, New York, is an American steakhouse, but it's it's uh, we we hark back to the traditional steakhouse, and we also have modern. We also have a modern feel for what we do, and it, we have a big menu. It's not just about steak. It's also about. It's not just about beef. It's also about seafood and fish and lobsters. It's also about great poultry that we were talking about, mm. and it's also about. Uh, outstanding produce, vegetables, you know, that make up the menu. So um, there are limitations in any model, but in a kitchen like uh, that I have at Porterhouse, there's actually a, we, we cook a lot of, uh, we have a great range. Mm-hmm. And I think it's that range, you know, we're speaking to an audience and we're there for our guests. Mm-hmm. You know, it is about, you know, how to uh, offer them what we do make it unique and different from other steakhouses, other mm-hmm. places, and we have, uh, uh, you know, we have prime beef, but we use natural, hormone-free beef, naturally mm-hmm. raised, no hormones, no antibiotics, mm-hmm. but it is prime beef. And you know, we are purchasing and, and the, the actual ingredients are key to what we do. We really try to find the very best in meat, fish poultry, produce, whatever that it is that goes on our menu, it, it, it's important that it be of really the highest quality. And that maybe sets us apart from other steakhouses, not saying that it's just that the de- determination we have, but we yes. also have a big menu, so it's a lot to fulfill every day. It's the perfect steakhouse if you have a lot of people, or even or just two of you, and uh, one person loves steak and the other doesn't because you're equally brilliant with working with both you know fish I, fowl thank you no but it's but that is <laughs> my you know it's a steakhouse but it's not it makes you know us in happy, that sense right? you, you know to, it's a real restaurant where you can get anyway well, we're going to we're going to an american cut. grill i think that's it that's it it's I, an american grill that's what we do that happens to have fabulous steaks that's all. yeah okay we're going to take another break here and we're going to come back and go on your journey
like what you hear so far? Support the network and become a member. Membership helps us bring you the best food radio in the world and gives you access to thousands of dollars in discounts at the sustainably minded businesses that support us. To become a member, visit heritageradionetwork.org today. Well, welcome back. I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton from the International Culinary Center. And today we're at Roberta's in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. And my guest. Bushwick, Bushwick. I'm from Bensonhurst. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got that mixed up. Oh, my God. At least I didn't say Marine Park. No, it's my we, fault. It's my we fault. We both lived at one point. Um, uh, but today my guest is that Brooklynite chef. Michael LaMonaco of Porterhouse, New York, and we are on his chef's journey. And, you know, let's pick up. You've just been the chef at the 21 Club, and um, what happened after the 21 Club? Yeah, seven That, that was seven the first years. time you yeah. were an executive chef. Right, and that was, you know, that was seven years, and uh, I had spent two years there before. You know, that was a transformative experience because uh, at 21, it was really where um, I embraced – uh, the American, uh, modern American cooking. Now, maybe it's a trite name, modern American cooking. What is that? Well, partly it's, it had to do with great ingredients. Partly it had to do with uh, finding your own creative center. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, and also reinterpreting classics. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did within the confines of 21's, you know, setup. It mm-hmm. was, it's a classic restaurant that's been there since the heyday of, of, of prohibition. Mm-hmm. So from there, um, really, I, I set off to do two things. One was television in the early days of Food Network. Right. And I had Michael's Place uh, starting in um, uh, uh, 1996 on uh, on Food Network for three years. Michael's Place was, uh, it was my show to, you know, cook and teach. And, you know, I, I enjoyed the communication aspect of getting people, you know, excited about cooking and also mm-hmm. Uh, people embracing that they could do this too, mm-hmm. and w- you know what can we do together with cooking and um, you know uh, skill skillful demonstration of of cooking techniques o- always I think will have a place. It may not be the most current st- thing on television now, but it'll come back. People will want to see technique again. Mm-hmm. Um, they do want to see it in other places. They'll want to see you know what technique was. So that was what that's what I did then. But also a year later in 1997, I. Uh, I accepted a position at the Windows on the World where I became the chef director. Uh, chef director. That was Joe Baum who gave me that title because he hated the word executive chef. In fact, oh, really? uh, at Porterhouse, I'm the chef partner because I'm, it's, it's uh, my restaurant with my partners yeah. uh, who are the backers and developers. And, but, so my title is chef partner, what is that, whatever that means. But, but Joe Baum hated titles. Hopefully it means you own the restaurant. <laughs> right, exactly. Or you're <laughs> responsible that's, for paying all the bills. Yes, right. <laughs> that's what it's about. But Joe Baum, who was one of the legendary restaurateurs, opened mm-hmm. three 300 restaurants in his day, including Windows on the World. That was tell, it, tell us about Windows and what the culture was. So when Joe hired, when Joe hired me and uh, and his partner David Emil, when they hired me, it was to be the chef director of Windows on the World Restaurant, the greatest bar on earth. The you know the whole operation. And oh, for our listeners out here, that was the restaurant at the World Trade Center. Yes. I should yes. say that. And you know that was a legendary restaurant for being at the World Trade Center. And Joe's vision in the early days was that it would be the epitome of American dining. And that was in 1976 when he opened, in 1976, the original restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I, in 1997, became the chef director of, the culinary director of those restaurants. There were a lot of um, rooms up there. You had Cellar in the Sky. Right, and we took Cellar in the Sky and turned it into something else. Uh, which Joe embraced. We turned it into Wild Blue. And uh-huh. Wild Blue was a chop house, and it was 50 seats. So in a way, it set me on the road to Porterhouse, New York, uh, these I years see. later. So you, you should explain that the, the restaurant was on the top of the building, and everybody wanted a window seat. And nobody wanted to sit right. in the middle. That's right. So they made this little... To explain well, how... Well, Joe it, was a genius because yes. the original windows... Windows on the world was just as you described. Everybody wanted a window seat, and he created he he created um, uh, this 
a small uh, cellar in the sky yes, cellar that had no windows, <laughs> yes. that had no windows. It was in the middle. <laughs> and he, uh, he surrounded it with a wine cellar and he put in music and a, a live guitar playing classical music and it was a prefix menu and it was all wine and food pairing, mm-hmm. which in 1976 was a novel idea in mm-hmm. an American restaurant. Mm-hmm. And, but in, in 1997, we, you know, it had all been revitalized. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was... Uh, the culinary director until until the end. It was a, an incredible experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a great staff, and mm-hmm. uh, we lost many many dear people on that day. Many many really important, wonderful colleagues and friends, and it was a devastating experience for everybody, uh, and for the city, and for the nation, and for the nation. And you were you. The story is that you were downstairs having your glasses well, fixed. I in, was in the most fortunate. Uh, we. Uh, I was uh, had not gone up to my office yet that morning, but you know, in the aftermath, we created Windows of Hope Family Relief Fund. We mm-hmm. raised twenty two million dollars really for that much? Uh, the families of food service workers who had lost somebody that day, mm-hmm. and we were able to um, uh, use those funds uh, for health care and emergency needs. And it has been um, as a scholarship fund for the last. Uh, for the last eight or nine years, children. yeah. So there's still uh, there are still funds that are set aside as a scholarship fund for uh, about 150 children who lost a, a parent on that day. That's, yeah. So you know this was uh, this was uh, something that had to be done. Yeah, and right. So d- let me ask you something. After you go through something like that, how what how do you reset yourself? Well, this is my city. This is where I yes. live and work. So more than anything, uh, I rededicated myself. Not only to what I do for me, but to do what my friends and colleagues were doing on that day: working in a restaurant, serving the public, working as uh, you know, working in hospitality. Hospitality. Some people don't like the word hospital. Hospitality is making people feel welcome and doing for them the things that they would like done for them. That makes that hospitality was what my colleagues and friends were doing on that day. So what I rededicated myself to was working in the industry to which they had dedicated their lives, I dedicate my life and continue to do that in their memory every day. So it is part of my uh, morning ritual it is part of my daily ritual to 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 consciously you know make that effort that this is a another day that I could be here to to dedicate myself to the memory of my my friends. That's extraordinary. It's true. It's extraordinary. So you know, Porterhouse, New York. We opened in two thousand and six. I continued to do television. I did a lot so of between two thousand and one. You had five right. years there. So and, you, you well, I did a lot Michael's of te- play. right. Well, I know I did Epicurious on the Travel oh, Epic, Channel right. for uh, seven years mm-hmm. until um, from ninety seven until uh, two thousand and six. Mm-hmm. I was doing Epicurious, so that was cooking and traveling. A lot of food and tra- food travel show is what it did was. You, did you miss being a chef in a kitchen? I was doing so much consulting. I did a cookbook in that period. I was really doing. The Cookbook's name is. Uh, uh, <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> okay, we'll remember wait, wait, it. Wait, 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 no, wait, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Cooking with Michael Lamonico. <laughs> no, wait, wait. Let, let's let's go back. Would somebody so, go to Amazon right now <laughs> and tell us <laughs> the author is Michael Lamonico? <laughs> All right. So okay. So, so, so how so, did you? So you know, the most important thing was really to keep working. And uh, working was cooking, was teaching, uh, and uh, you know there was there, the, I I never I never stopped. Uh, but certainly to find a place in New York was really my goal. To find a, a place uh, to to be my home, mm-hmm. uh, a place that would be you know really uh, my home and my home base. And uh, you know uh, the opportunity to do that at the Time Warner Center mm-hmm. really came up. Mm-hmm. in 2006 mm-hmm. and I jumped at it because it's a great location overlooking the park and really to build an American grill that was casual and comfortable you know really to do that uh, was really something that I had really worked for for really many years well the Time Warner building is sort of the iconic location for restaurants in New York you're you're Part uh, your uh, neighbors there are per se and right. Massa and Avoce, so you're you're in the you're you know you're in the uh, big time well, there. You're exactly. at the top of the pyramid. You couldn't have done better. You know, <laughs> so so the book nightly specials 
was the book that we were talking about a second ago, <laughs> Nightly Specials. <laughs> Jack Inslee, our producer, yeah. ran in here with this, and he didn't see but it. Thank God. I didn't know I'd get a chance to plug a book. But <laughs> Nightly Specials was really about cooking, you know, really about cooking the nightly specials in restaurants and sort of the mm-hmm. creative process. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the the casual dining world has grown and that's really what dining is about not formal not stuffy but casual and relaxed so mm-hmm. porterhouse new york was my uh, was my idea of how to take what might have been a little stuffy the classic steakhouse make it casual and mm-hmm. comfortable in a mm-hmm. great iconic location so we're in a restaurant collection as you mentioned yes. per se and masa and avoce and stone mm-hmm. rose and now we have a new place um, that i opened a few months ago on the same floor in the time warner center called center bar and center bar is a lounge where we're making really great cocktails not Wait a minute, does it have any windows? It has a beautiful oh, atrium okay. so window. Oh, okay, so it is in the center. It is in center, center bar <laughs> overlooks the Columbus Circle and Ooh. Central Park, and we have... It's Didn't a, we just get a great review in the Post, in the post today? It's, it's a piano bar. Today, we have, go get it. <laughs> we have jazz piano playing night, you know, five nights a week. I love music, ah. so incorporating music was a big part of it. And it's all small plates of different food, different than Porterhouse. So it's a new creative outlet. So that's always it exciting. It, open? it opens at 4 p.m. Oh, four. That's and, and it time. opens at one o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays, so we uh-huh. get a little bit of afternoon on and the weekends. But how many seats? Fifty. Oh, that's a nice so it's session. small, it's yeah. intimate, it's yeah. very comfortable. But for me, it's another outlet. So mm-hmm. we're you know we're doing uh, you know a, a, a whole new range of dishes, and mm-hmm. they're small plates. What does that mean? They're not big portions. You know, steaks are big. Yes, but something different, and that's not only for me, but for my team. Mm-hmm. It's great to have this. This additional outlet, and it's also paired with uh, really a wonderful cocktail program that James Moreland and Brad Nugent, my two beverage guys, have put together. And it was also about having an encyclopedic approach to cocktails. Not only our house cocktails, our our own signature ones, but we really do a very broad range of classic cocktails. Mm. From what's your favorite classic cocktail? For me personally, yes. for me personally, the drink we make a, a a drink actually that we call a king's old fashioned. That's one of my favorites. But I, my true favorite is is a Manhattan. I really mine too. I'm a Manhattan. What, what whiskey do you put in it? I like rye. I do. And what and, kind of rye? And, you know, the, <laughs> I'm a Michter's fan. Well, Mick, yeah, there are some great ryes, and in fact, there's a there's a rye, there's a New York rye that you can get now. I heard. There's I haven't some, had that. You know, yet. I like rye, and you know why? Because I remember rye even from my childhood. Not that I was drinking it, <laughs> but I remember the adults liked rye. I remember a song, rye whiskey. Rye that's right. Whiskey, rye whiskey. <laughs> exactly. I rye whiskey. And they I used to have, my rye they used to have r- rock and rye, which had which had. <laughs> Uh, rock crystal sugar hanging in the bottle, so you always got a, a <laughs> that, I, that's an old that's an wow. old uh, an old thing that I remember. But I you know I like history, and I think that in cooking you have to have a sense of where you're going, and you have to have a sense of modernity, and you know moving ahead. But I also enjoy you know looking back and paying tribute to those who came before. And uh, that's Michael, why I like I like my I like to I like to go to Michael. Italy. We have to do another show. <laughs> okay. I mean, we've run out of time, but will you promise me I, when, when the weather gets warmer? Uh, how about we take my uh, portable show and we go out and we do Brooklyn together? Oh yeah, we'll visit like five or six uh, of our local oh, yeah. haunts. We'll go to Sheepshead Bay. Yeah. And oh, that's my, great. My brother showed me a place with oh my god mozzarella. <laughs> they give it to you warm in your hand yes. and you go, oh my God. <laughs> and so it's no, no. Okay. So Michael, okay, thank we'll you so much, Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. All right. And we'll see you next time. Shout out to Robin Cohen and Jack Inslee, our producers. And see you next time. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.
Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.